The only thing I knew about Fear before playing it for the first time the other week was that the girl from The Ring or The Grudge or one of the twins from The Shining was the antagonist and you also had bullet time. But as it turns out, Fear, the word, but the letters are arranged into an acronym, is a first person shooter with heavy horror elements. Developed by Monolith, who also developed this game's two sequels and the two DLCs for it. Nowadays, they're far more well known for the two most recent Middle Earth games, Shadow of War and Shadow of Mordor. The game's premise is pretty simple and is as follows Armor Cam, a Department of Defense contracting company, loses control of their superhuman soldiers, which for some reason are remote controlled by a psychic leader, who then slaughter en masse the members of the company which they are contained. And you were sent in as a member of Fear, the first encounter assault recon to illuminate the leader who has said psychic powers, with the idea that being that killing him causes the army to shut down. But over the course of the game, you uncover a conspiracy that threatens the world as you know it. You play as the point man, a newly trained fear operative who is set into the field because of your insanely fast reflexes. Or, as it was, the game's explanation for the slow-mo mechanic. It's your standard affair here, signs go bad, guns go boom. For a game released in 2005, which now means it's 16 years old, it looks pretty good. And this makes sense when you think about what fear was historically for many people. 2005 was two years before Crisis. So what I'm trying to say is this was 2005's Crisis, basically. People would use this to bench their systems and that makes a lot of sense. 16 years ago this game was top of the line and had the best textures, lighting and shaders that really existed at the time. But how does it fare in 2021? Well, it's fairly obvious that just from the title screen that it's aged. But the actual in-game graphics are nowhere near as dated as the main menu would suggest. And a really big part of this comes down to Fear's lighting system. And the big word here is dynamic. Most of the light sources within Fear, and strangely enough only one of its DLCs, emit light that is actively blocked by objects in the world, including enemies. And this helps greatly in the combat and horror scenarios. If you see a shadow, it exists. Something is casting that shadow. And a bit of a side note here. Why do so many games still not have dynamic shadows? Moving on. Another important graphical thing in this game is the particle effects. They're simply put, immersive. During a gunfight, it is common for you to have to reposition yourself because of all the built-up particles in the air. Smoke, dust, whatever it is, it's really cool. And yes... Human innards are on that list too. Just aiming and unloading on an enemy looks great. And the smoke, blood, and the sparks just add this kineticism to each round. It's great. I wish more games did this kind of stuff. And if you really want to appreciate it, just watch in slow-mo. One of the only things that I knew about this game was that you could go into slow-mo and kick someone. I remember some kid back in primary school talking about it, and I guess it just kind of stuck with me. I think it's because, well, it sounds really fucking cool, and that's basically what this game is. This game is a combat sandbox. Over the course of the game's eight-ish hours, you'll have an excellent time shooting up heavily armed guards, private security mall cops, and extremely heavily armed guards, and also nightmare creatures afloat. You'll do this via the game's arsenal, ten guns which are all very different from each other. You've got your typical SMG, shotgun, pistol, assault rifle, and your sci-fi future guns. Each gun has use, all of them feel great. Admittedly, I think it's mainly due to the particle effects. Like for example, a shotgun just straight up liquefies people. A big part of the combat in this game is tactics. It pays off to try to minimize the potential for damage as enemies hit really hard in this game. For example, I played on normal, and it's very possible for one enemy to rip you a new one. Two enemies firing at you at a time is a death sentence. And this is why grenades are really important. You can easily kill a group of enemies if they're bunched up, or you can use grenades to stun them for a brief moment. Either way, they're effective, and for when grenades don't work, as I mentioned before, you can always kick them. Melee attacks are an instant kill, by the way, unless they're a power suit or a mech, which, yeah, makes sense. And slow motion applies to everything I've said so far in this video. In terms of the tactics side of it, 
It basically acts as a way to move between cover or towards enemies at a much lesser risk. You can still get shot, but you get that opportunity to dodge the bullet, which is, you know, again, really cool. It also allows you to line up a shot or to simply survey an area or a situation with a much lesser risk. And it, honestly, it just looks really fucking cool. This game was very much based around the idea of being an action hero. You can slide along the floor, knock out an enemy's legs, you can throw grenades and shotgun someone's head off. And it all flows together really smoothly. I wouldn't call this game a motion shooter by any means, but it's definitely a shooter that encourages you to move. And this is where the game's other big feature comes in. A lot of people have raved about the AI and fear. It has a bit of a reputation in the gaming community as being one of the best in any game. And I don't necessarily agree. I've seen better, I've seen AI that is really close to human players. But don't get me wrong, Fear's AI is still good, but when compared to AI in more recent titles, it simply doesn't really hold up. But it is still extremely good at outmaneuvering you in combat, and it's great at reacting to what you do. Even just your flashlight. It's all done really well, it sells the effect of being a single man against a squad of trained individuals. They call out where they think you are, if they're going to throw a grenade or wherever they need reinforcements. You can glean a lot from what they say. In combat, it is essential to know where the enemies are. Because as I just said before, one enemy can kill you. You really aren't safe until everyone is dead. And the enemy callouts are brilliant as they allow you to understand what's happening. If someone just threw a grenade, you will definitely know. And that's important because another thing this game doesn't really have is HUD elements for a lot of stuff. If an enemy throws a grenade, there's no little grenade icon that appears in like a radial radar or something. You just have to trust that you heard it land. Which is kind of cool. I actually kind of like it. I didn't think I would because there's a lot of games out there where the AI will just grenade spam and you'll just be dead. They don't really do that in this. Grenades are always used to like clear you out of a choke point. Which again, good AI. And I think the best part about the enemies having like really accurate callouts is that it adds a sort of personality to the enemies because the enemies are just copy and pasted there is no really unique models for each of them they all look fairly identical so it gives them personality which really helps immerse you more and makes the game more enjoyable as a result they'll dive through windows they'll flip a table for cover they'll they'll try to sneak up on you for a melee attack and I think in my favorite thing they do if the enemy squad is running low on members, they'll ask for reinforcements, and if there is no reinforcements, they'll just tell everyone to shut up, almost as if they're trying to hide. It's really great. I think this is why this AI definitely deserves its reputation. It's not the best I've seen, but I reckon it's like top 20 for sure. And. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Fear's other defining genre, however. Fear is technically a horror game, but a lot of people only praise the shooter part of the horror FPS. The horror sequences in this game are phenomenally well done. With a few exceptions here and there, the grand majority of the horror sequences are really good. You can be walking through a room and then there's just a creepy little girl watching you. Or maybe this guy is gonna take her over there I guess. There's no massive jump scares really, it's all subtle stuff that is easily missed unless it's important to the story because then you'll be forced to listen to the bad guys cryptically explain the narrative to you. Which I'm admittedly not a fan of, but at least fear makes it look good. So I'll ignore it. The horror aspects are extremely varied in how they work as well. So like I said before, while there's no massive jump scares, there's still the smaller ones because as a horror game you kind of just have it to keep the player expecting one. But you also have these really, really well done psychological horror parts as well, which aren't just random filler, they have a meaning within the narrative. But 
I want to talk about that because for now I want to touch on how this game uses the player's fear. Get it? Fear? No? Okay. The game uses the player's fear against them a lot. The game's upgrade system, which has you finding these injectable things that boost your health and slow-mo time. That's great and all, but the caveat comes in when you realise where these are placed. They're hardly ever in the normal point A to B of the maps, and they're nearly always in the dark, dingy lit tunnels or office cubicles. The kind of thing that is pure red flags for people who don't like jump scares. It's actually kind of genius. In order for you to really unleash your combat potential, you have to give in to the horror elements. Which is fucked, but I love it. This game will constantly have you on edge because this game doesn't signpost its creepy shit. It just happens, which is really good. You have no idea if this traditionally creepy hallway is creepy or just a hallway. Because fear constantly uses these spaces for both horror segments and combat segments. But it's nigh impossible in the moment to realise which one it's going to be. Because half the time, these hallways are just hallways. But then every now and then, something happens, and it might make you jump because it comes out of nowhere. Which is great, and I love it. Big fan. Another thing that I appreciate about this game is its narrative. It's not great, I'm not gonna lie. But it's good enough that it keeps you intrigued and provides enough content for the player to become actively engaged in. But what is the narrative you might be asking? Well, here's the part of the video where I talk for 15 minutes about the narrative because I just list off what happens in order. Anyway, let's start. Armacan, a Department of Defense contracting company, loses control of their superhuman soldiers controlled by the psychic Paxton Fettel who for some reason has suddenly snapped, executing the guards and staff of Armor Cam's headquarters. Fear, a special forces branch created to tackle supernatural and paranormal threats is called in to eliminate Fettel, with the idea being that once he is dead, super soldiers will shut down. Throughout the game, it becomes obvious that something just isn't right. You start to see a girl following you, you have strange hallucinogenic dreams. Fettel himself even tries to communicate to you. And as the game progresses, you learn more and more about Armacam's founder, Harlan Wade, and his Project Origin. Project Origin was born from the midst of the Vietnam War. Communication between forces in the field and their commanders were too slow, with many troops being lost due to inefficiency. The program used a strong psychic as a genetic base for future psychics. And as it turns out, spoilers here, Alma Wade, the little girl that's been following you around, is that strong psychic. When she was seven years old, she was put into a medically induced coma and was not even mentioned in the law until seven years later, when Armacan would forcibly impregnate her and bring the child to term. The first of her children was deemed a failure and was eliminated. The second born was when she was 16 years old, Paxton Fettel, who was a strong psychic, not as strong as Alma, but strong enough for what the American military had in mind. The only catch is that Alma and Paxton Fettel would have a strong psychic connection that would cause Paxton the freak out killing seven scientists at the age of 10. This was called the first synchronization event. Following this incident, Project Origin was deemed a failure and Elma had her life support cut. And in one of the game's more fucked up twists, she would die six days later. And that brings us to the game's present date. Present day Armin Cam decides to restart Project Origin using the still alive Fedel. During a mission to the underground facility that once housed the project, multiple teams do not return. This leads to the current CEO of Armachan, Guinevere Aristotide, I think, to believe that Alma is still down there in some form or another. The game never explicitly states whether or not she's alive or dead, but I'm pretty sure she's like a ghost, I guess. With Alma once more awakened, she reconnects with Paxton, turning him violent again as he now realises what has happened to his mother who is Alma, if you haven't caught on, and what needs to be done to those that wrong them. He mobilizes the superhuman army into slaughtering anyone who tries to stop him and his mission to release Alma's ghost from the vault, what is effectively like a psychic nullifying like prison, effectively. Over the course of the game, your main mission is to track down and kill Paxton Fettel. He constantly eludes you until the game's climactic mission down within the armor camp facility. You end up killing him and the Reptilian army does shut down, completing your main mission. But not before discovering that Harlan Wade wishes to open up the vault 
releasing Alma and dooming the world at large. You decide to blow up the facility in the hopes that it destroys Alma for once and for all. You expose the reactor cells, destroy them, facility explodes, but you escape. But you're ultimately exposed to the explosion as it sends you flying. You get knocked out. But rejoice, because you're picked up by the supporting cast of characters and flown away to safety. But nah, you're not, because Alma has other plans. Oh, and in a weird twist, you're Alma's first son. Which I think is really weird and like kind of just added on at the end to further confuse the player. I don't think it needed to happen. It seems like it exists solely to explain your slow motion ability, but you don't need to do that. It's a game. Oh, and it also means a Pax and your brother, and that's Fear 1. Overall, I really liked it. It had a lot of heart and a lot of just good things. Pacing is kind of iffy towards the middle as certain levels dragged on, but it's still a lot of fun. The story, while hard to follow at times, is still good. A lot of it is done through telephone calls that you can play back via an entry machine. And for me anyway, I found that was really, it was like really hard to hear them. Like it was turned down a lot, like in the mix. I also just, they weren't all that interesting. A lot of the backstory about Alma and Project Origin is done through these phone calls, which are basically just audio logs. It's really hard to know who, who's involved with what their role was, but it's fine. You can still piece it together. And we're not done yet because Fear still has two DLCs. But before I cover them, I need to briefly mention the different canon timelines. The Viviendi timeline is non-canon. It includes the original game and its two DLCs, what we're about to cover. The Monolith timeline includes everything but the original game's two DLCs. And for the sake of this review, I will be regarding these two DLCs as canon to Fear 1, but not to the series as a whole, if that makes sense. And when I eventually review Fear 2 and 3, I will not be mentioning his, his DLCs at all, just to not confuse myself or you guys. We'll be talking about Extraction Point first, as it is a direct sequel to Fear 1's narrative, then we'll move on to Perseus Mandate, because honestly, it isn't very good. Extraction Point, as I said, takes place immediately after the end of Fear 1, like literally moments after. It starts with your helicopter from the end of Fear 1 crash landing into an apartment block, very much like the one from the original game. But that aside, you navigate outside and you have an interesting little sequence where a group of replicants are shut down due to Federal's death. But, at last, in a fairly foreseeable twist, Federal isn't actually dead. Well, he technically is. But he's like Alma now, a ghost or something. Even he doesn't understand it. I know it doesn't make sense. Not much does anymore. You killed me. I didn't like that. Alma shows up and you have to run, you then get a call from your friends who tell you to meet them nearby, you meet Holiday, you fight for a warehouse, then join up with him. It's actually kind of neat, fighting with him as well. It's not much, but it does change up the action. You even get a sniper segment. And then he dies in a really fucking good sequence. And then you go into a subway, then a hospital, and the other friend dies. And then the game ends. The narrative is very simple in this DLC. You are literally just trying to reach an extraction point on a hospital roof. Which you do, and then the helicopter explodes, so no more extraction. Um, there's still audio logs and the forms of telephones scattered around the joint, but in comparison to the base game, it's all very simple. And hopefully it's clear from the clips in the background that this DLC has a different approach to a lot of what the original game did, the most important of which being the gunplay. Overall, it is a step up from the original game. The combat is puncher, and you're less likely to be killed by a shotgun round, because it seems like enemies do less damage whilst you do more. I'm not a massive fan of this change. I would prefer to be on the same level as the enemies, but I imagine it was a popular change at the time. Moreover, the weapons are really similar. There's a few new ones, a laser rifle, a minigun, and a deployable turret, but it's important to note that the weapons present in base game fear are still uh, just as good as they were in base game fear, so there's nothing to worry about in terms of that. And 
That kind of applies to nearly everything. This DLC is basically just Fear 1.5. It's some new levels added on with nearly everything present in the base game amped up to 11. Combat sequences are generally bigger and louder. They go for longer with more enemies and with new enemy types sprinkled in as well. Namely, a bigger mech and a heavy with a shield and minigun. And they both work pretty well. They're often signposted by the game, placing heavy weapons around the map, which is kind of needed because they are both bullet sponges. But one thing that I think is really lacking in this DLC is the horror elements. It simply just doesn't land this time. Base Game Fear has this really subtle horror where Alma will be watching you or something like that. And then this DLC just has heaps of invisible enemies that jump at you. It is kind of disappointing, but it more than makes up for it in the Alma set pieces, which are great. But not really all that spooky. Both Alma and now Fettel's vision sequences are much more grand than what they were in the base game. Although it needs to be said, Alma is really strange in this DLC. She actually seems to be helping you at times, eliminating entire groups of enemies into like red mist. Or at other times she'll spawn these stealthy zombie things and try to fuck you up. She also routinely shows up the fuck around the world, and I don't really understand why she helps you sometimes, but not others. But overall, it does seem like young Alma helps and teenage Alma hurts, if that makes sense. But overall, Extraction Point is really good expansion pack for Fear. It's really faithful whilst adding its own ways of dealing with some of Fear's content. And for the price it's normally at, you might as well just buy it. And now we have to talk about Perseus Mandate. Perseus Mandate was the second and final DLC release for Fear. And, well, it's a mixed bag. I'll say straight off the cuff that it is not anywhere near as good as either the base game or Extraction Point, but it is still worth playing if you liked either of them or are just playing through the series, but it is not anywhere near as good as either of them. Nearly everything has suffered as a result of what I can only assume is a rushed development period. I think the biggest offender here is the visuals. It's dull. Nothing else really comes to mind when I think of good looking scenes in Mandate. It kind of reminds me of a Half-Life 2 mod. And what I mean by that is it doesn't have polish. Some scenes don't even have lighting. They just appear to be lit by a global light or something. Environments are largely uninspired and far too similar to both Fear and Extraction Point. Some levels are literally the same actually, just reversed. And I want to be clear when I say this, I only made it about 75% through the game before I couldn't play it anymore. I just was not enjoying it in the slightest. Nothing is really good about it, it's all average or subpar. Even the gameplay has been altered in very small ways to make it over a worse experience. For example, it seems like you take far less damage while enemies take far more damage. You no longer really have to strategize and think logically, you can run into a room and just kill them all and maybe sometimes take cover. Plus the game gives you more than enough medkits to cover any that you do use. It seems like the devs looked at games that released between 2005 and 2007 and went, okay, yeah, let's copy that. Like for example, in the previous expansion pack, Extraction Point, I praised the segment where you walked around the holiday. I know this is going to seem weird, but I absolutely hate those segments in Perseus Mandate. A fair chunk of this expansion pack is just large, open rooms filled with enemies who cannot comprehend having more than one target. The scrub based gameplay completely breaks Fear's excellent NI, as it is something that it obviously was not made for. I appreciate the effort that went into this expansion pack, but it obviously was wasted on emulating other games instead of sticking to Fear's strengths. For example, Perseus Mandate introduces a new faction of enemies that are completely stupid and a waste of time called the Nightcrawlers, and they don't really offer any real differences between them and the ATC guards or the replicant soldiers. The only real difference is that their he elites aren't heavy, so they're like really fast, and they move really, 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 really quick. It's just so disappointing. They even sound really bad, they have that dumb bass boosted gruff action mode voice. I hate it. Him down. I want the replicants back, please. Even the new weapons that they bring into the fight are boring and uninspired. An assault rifle, but this time the scope is red. Whoa. An electric shock cannon fan that does two hit kills, and it leaves their bodies completely unaltered, unlike 
you know, it should be like the particle rifle, which like leaves him a skeleton. That's cool. There's also a grenade launcher that does about what you think it does. And all three of these weapons combined are somehow less usable than anything that extraction point like added. And that extends to pretty much everything. Which is why I'm not even going to bother explaining its narrative, because it's nothing special. Hell, it's not even interesting. You might notice I also haven't talked about the horror aspects. Because again, it's nothing. It's jump scares and screamers. It's disappointing. But returning to the entirety of Fear here for a moment, Fear overall is worth your time. And it's clear to see why so many people think it's a great game, and that's because it is. Fundamentally, it's a tactical first-person shooter which isn't afraid to get spooky at times. And when you can get the entire franchise for like 15 Australian when it's on sale, it's a no-brainer. It's a good time. It's a great time. I highly recommend it. Even if the DLCs were a little bit underwhelming at times. And, well, I have to go play Fear 2 now. So, wish me luck. Thanks for watching.